Welcome to the Game Before the Money podcast, an oral history of pro and college football. This episode, Denver Broncos legend Lionel Taylor. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Game Before the Money podcast. I'm Jackson Michael, and this podcast continues the work of the Game Before the Money, Voices of the Men Who Built the NFL, a book that featured interviews with NFL legends like Bart Starr, Kenny Houston, and Frank Gifford. The goal is to document the lives and stories of the players who helped build pro football into what it is today. Lionel Taylor is a man that I've wanted to chat with for a long time, and so I'm very thankful that he granted me some time, and he's got some great stories to share with you about his time as a wide receiver in the American Football League and as a member of Coach Chuck Knoll's staff with the 1970s Pittsburgh Steelers. You can hear Lionel with former Steeler Charlie Davis and reporter Vito Stellino discussing the 1974 Pittsburgh Steelers draft class in episode number 47 of the Game Before the Money podcast. As a player, Lionel Taylor was the first player to make 100 catches in a single season. That was in 1961 with the Denver Broncos. And to put into perspective as to how big of a deal making 100 receptions was, when Art Monk set an NFL record with 106 catches in 1984, he was only the third player in pro football history to have at least 100 catches in a season. So while there were at least eight receivers who had 100 catches in in the 2020 NFL season, for a long time, that 100-catch benchmark set by Lionel Taylor was an extremely rare event. Bear in mind that Taylor accomplished that feat in a 14-game season rather than the 16 games that receivers had from the late 1970s onward. So it's still a major achievement even in a 16-game season, And that trend will likely continue into 17-game and potentially 18-game regular seasons in the future. Lionel Taylor led the American Football League in receptions five times, including four times in a row. I will tell you about the historical significance of that statistic as the show moves forward. Taylor was all AFL several times and is a member of the Denver Broncos Ring of Fame. In fact, he was a member of the inaugural class of the Broncos Ring of Fame. Lionel Taylor was born in 1935 and grew up in West Virginia. Taylor played college football at New Mexico Highlands University. You might wonder how a kid from West Virginia wound up playing college ball all the way in New Mexico. I started school at West Virginia State there at the Institute of West Virginia outside of Charleston, West Virginia. And uh, I was the only child, so I figured I had to get away from West Virginia. There was no future in West Virginia for me. The furthest uh, scholarship I had was New Mexico, and I had no idea what it was all about, but that's what I decided I would get as far away from home as I could. So I went to New, went to New Mexico Highlands. One of Taylor's high school classmates, Charlie Cowan, also played for New Mexico Highlands with Taylor. Cowan played for the Los Angeles Rams for 15 years and made three Pro Bowls. Lionel Taylor, of course, is best known for his time making several AFL All-Star games with the Denver Broncos. Taylor's pro football career, however, started under George Hallis on the 1959 Chicago Bears. Taylor tells us the interesting way that he made it to the Bears and added that Chicago played him on defense. You know, like now they have the draft and everybody whining and dying you and do all that. In those days, nobody looked at the small schools that much and they sent you a postcard and you filled it out and sent it back. So that's what I did. And so I 
went up there as, as a linebacker. I didn't last long enough to get a cup of coffee. Lionel added that the Bears also tried him out at defensive back. George Allen was a defensive assistant coach with the Bears in 1959. Taylor was given the unfortunate task of covering future Hall of Famer Bobby Mitchell during a game. And uh, I was playing defensive back, and they had Bobby Mitchell at wide receiver. And we were one-on-one, and it was third down. I'll never forget, about third and six. And Bobby Mitchell ran a slant. And they hit him for the first down, and I came up and made the tackle. And George Allen told me, he says, you're playing him too deep. I said, hell, he run backwards faster than I can run forward. (laughs) 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 If I'd have got up there close, it'd have been all over. (laughs) The American Football League started play in 1960. The Denver Broncos were one of the original teams of the new league. Taylor found a new opportunity with the Broncos early in the 1960 season. And I just left the Bears because they put me on waivers for two games. Well, I had the chance to leave. So I left and went to Denver, took a look at Denver, and I said, well, I could play here. This league won't make it. I said, but if I could make a name for myself, I can go back to the NFL and make some money. And it was the best move I ever made, though, because I never went back. Lionel Taylor is famous for his 1961 season, his second with the Broncos, in which he became the first player to make 100 receptions in a single pro football season. In many ways, however, 1960, his first year with the Broncos, might have been even more impressive. He missed the first two games of the season and still caught 92 passes to lead the league. That broke the all-time single-season receiving record set by Hall of Famer Tom Fears in 1950. And remember, Taylor missed the first two games of the season and still set the record. Lionel talked about that first season and his desire to play receiver rather than linebacker. Yeah, the first year there was my best year I think I've ever had. When I was at Highlands, you played both ways, you know. Little school, you played everywhere, you know. Like I told you, that didn't take long to find out I wasn't a linebacker. So I came back the next year, and I said, the only way I'll come back is as a receiver. In the book, The Game Before the Money, legendary Broncos safety Goose Gosselin talked about a 1960 AFL game between the Bills and Broncos played in Denver. The Bills jumped out to a 38-7 38-7 to seven lead with just over four and a half minutes left in the third quarter. The Bills kicked off and it was a touchback. On the next play, Broncos quarterback Frank Trapuca threw an 80-yard touchdown pass to Lionel Taylor and it was 38-14. to 14. By midway through the fourth quarter, the Trapuca to Taylor connection had struck for two more touchdowns. I caught a hitch on one side of the field and it was muddy and I went from one side to the other side and went about 40 or 50 yards for a touchdown and then we called another pass I called a one-hander over the middle and went for a touchdown. That one-handed catch that Lionel told us about came on fourth down and went for a 35-yard touchdown. That made the score 38-28 to with just over eight minutes left. The game ended as a 38-38 tie after the Broncos trailed 38-7 late in the third quarter. Taylor ended up with 199 yards receiving on nine catches and scored three touchdowns. Despite having a great game, he told me that he still has some regrets. They thought I had a good game. But I thought I could have won the game. I went out on the two-yard line, and we had to kick a field goal, the tie. If I could have just pushed two more yards, we could have won the game. But it didn't happen. Football is a game of inches indeed. The 1960 Broncos finished with a 4-9-1 and record and finished last in the American Football League's West Division. Taylor led the AFL 
with that record-breaking tally of 92 receptions. He finished third in the league in receiving yards with over 1,200 yards and finished tied for second in touchdowns. Remember now, he missed the first two games of the season and he still compiled those great numbers. He averaged over 100 yards receiving per game and that placed him second in the league in that category as well. As Lionel noted earlier, his first season with the Broncos might have been his best. The 1961 Broncos Media Guide stated that Taylor was, quote, everybody's all everything in the AFL in 1960. The Media Guide added that he, quote, unquestionably has the greatest hands in football. Taylor already owned the single season record for most catches in a season going into 1961. Taylor broke his own record in the 1961 season, grabbing exactly 100 catches, the first player in pro football history to attain that mark. He went into the final week of the season with 95 catches as the Broncos went into Dallas to face the Texans. Lionel says he wasn't thinking about reaching the century mark. He also said that he was disappointed after the game as he could have wound up with even more receptions. I caught a couple of passes and I goofed. I I was so upset because we was losing. I threw the ball away. I threw the uh, forward lateral after catching it and and that was a penalty so they took the catch away. And I was fortunate to end up with 100 catches because I goofed a couple of times. I was just upset. And uh, I think George Herring, who was the quarterback at the time, I didn't catch it from Dubuque. I caught it from a guy by the name of George Herring. I never thought about catching 100 passes. Never did. The Broncos lost to the Dallas Texans 49-21. to For you younger listeners, the Dallas Texans are now known as the Kansas City Chiefs and are not affiliated with today's Houston Texans. The American Football League held its first All-Star game after that 1961 season. Lionel was chosen for the West Squad's roster. He said that he didn't see too much action in Coach Sid Gilman's formation. Sid Gilman was the head coach, and he had a lot of his guys from San Diego. And we went to the big spread offense, and I was so far out. I was the widest guy on the spread. Hell, they had to pump air out there to me. I never saw the ball. The West All-Stars defeated the East 47-27, powered by three touchdown passes by Dallas Texans quarterback Cotton Davidson. Cotton shared many great stories in the book, The Game Before the Money, which of course is available at Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and through the publisher, the University of Nebraska Press. The Broncos finished 3-11 in 1961, They fired head coach Frank Filchok and hired Jack Faulkner for the 1962 season. The team finished 7-7 that year. Once again, Lionel Taylor led the American Football League in receptions. That stood as his third season in a row that he led the AFL in receptions. Only Lionel Taylor, Don Hudson, and Raymond Berry have led the league in receptions three years in a row. That is as of the 2021 season and includes every year of the NFL and AFL. As a side note, Max Speedy of the Cleveland Browns led the AAFC in receptions for three seasons in a row. As a second side note, Don Hudson, Raymond Berry, and Max Speedy are all in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Lionel Taylor is still waiting his turn. Taylor again made the AFL All-Star Game in 1962. This time he played an important role in the offense. The East All-Stars tied the game at 14 when New York's Larry Grantham intercepted Len Dawson and returned the ball for a touchdown. West coach Hank Stram replaced Dawson with Lionel's teammate Frank Trapuca. Taylor takes us into the AFL West All-Stars huddle in the fourth quarter of the 1962 AFL All-Star game at Balboa Stadium in San Diego. In those days, if you won, you got $700. That's all you got. You know, five if you lost. 
and never forget we were in the huddle and the scores was tied up and we put Frank Chapuca in because Lenny Dawson had started and Frank Chapuca didn't really know all the plays because he hadn't practiced that much and Abner Haynes made the statement he says well Frank why don't you just throw what you and Lionel did in Denver and we, we called three plays and I was standing in the end zone we won the game Abner Hayes' plan worked to a T. Taylor first caught a 49-yard pass. I caught one, and I went about, I don't know, quite a, quite a distance. And Frank Tepuka says, if you did it faster, you should have scored. Next, Taylor broke free for 25 yards. That brought the ball to the East's 20-yard line. Lionel felt a bit winded after two substantial receptions that involved a lot of sprinting. And I was about running out and Frank was out of the center and I was trying to tell him and he just told me this is what he said to me he said I don't care just get outside and he did it and he put it right there Trapuga's perfect pass and Taylor's fine reception resulted in a 20 yard game winning touchdown Taylor stood as the big hero of the West All-Stars in their 21 to 14 victory in the 1962 AFL All-Star game did that mean that he would get a hero's welcome on the team bus as they left Balboa Stadium? Well, not exactly. And guess what? They went off and left me. That bus left me at Balboa Stadium. <laughs> I did an interview after the game. In those days, they didn't pay too much attention to who was missing, so they left me there. And I got a ride with a, a custodian <laughs> truck, took me back to that hotel. I mean, I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't do a head count on the bus? Yeah, they left me out there. <laughs> <laughs> the team bus might have left Taylor behind, but Taylor kept leaving AFL defensive backs behind with his high reception totals. In 1963, he led the AFL in pass receptions for the fourth consecutive season. Only one other player has led the league in receptions four consecutive times. That player is Don Hudson. And for the record, Taylor's reception total in each of those seasons would have also led the NFL. So there's no asterisk in these totals. In fact, as of 2021, Don Hudson and Lionel Taylor are the only players in history to lead the league in receptions four times. And they both did it four times in a row. 1963 also brought Lionel a new teammate on the Broncos, future Hall of Fame defensive back Willie Brown from Grambling. Taylor says that he and Brown often held a little competition after practice. We had a little game for 50 cents after practice. They would throw me 10 passes one-on-one -on -one against him, and I had to catch seven of them. If I did, he owed me 50 cents. Uh, and uh, certain routes we could run, but the thing was, was I didn't win too many 50 cents from him. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that probably helped both of you quite a bit. Oh, we played after, yeah, we played after practice at just about every day, at least twice a week. We stay after practice, go one on one. I couldn't run a hitch, I couldn't run a slant or nothing like that. I had to go down the field at least 10, 12 yards. We we're very competitive, and we we was good friends too. As I said before, Taylor led the AFL in receiving in 1963. That marked the fourth season in a row. Taylor wasn't just paired with one quarterback either. The Broncos went through several starting quarterbacks during Lionel's career. Frank Terpuka, Mickey Slaughter, George Herring, John McCormick. Those are all Broncos quarterbacks that Taylor played with. And that's not a complete list either. I asked him how he remained so consistent through the revolving door of passers in Denver. He said he put the extra time into practice. If the weather was decent, I stayed out even on the road sometime. And we stayed in practice. I would stay out and still catch the ball. Back in those days, it, the budget was limited. So we went to New York. We played Buffalo. We played New York. Uh, we played the Jets. We played... Boston, and so we stayed back there and practice, you know, at night. And so I would stay there. And if we go, if we fly in like the night before the game, we practice sometime on the road. I still would stay out and catch the ball the night before. Despite Taylor's great ability, 
The Broncos often found victories hard to come by. The team entered the final week of the 1964 AFL season at 2-10-1. They faced the Houston Oilers at Houston. Oiler receiver Charlie Hennigan had 93 catches coming into the game and had a chance to break Lionel's single season record of 100. Willie Brown covered Hennigan that day and asked Taylor about coverages before the game. Mrs. Uh, Lionel, shall I uh, play him tight or what? I said, just play him the way you normally play him. Don't worry about trying to keep him from catching the 100. We knew he was going to go for the 100. They fed him the ball, though. Him and George Blatt, I don't blame him. They threw nothing but hitches and stuff to him until he got to his 101. And he about have got him anyway, don't get me wrong. He's a good, very good receiver. Charlie Hennigan made eight catches on the day to finish with 101 for the season. Taylor finished tied for second in receptions in the AFL in 1964, putting an end to an almost unparalleled dominance of leading pro football in receptions. Remember, only the great Don Hudson led pro football in receptions for more consecutive seasons than Lionel Taylor did. Taylor was back on top again in 1965 with 85 receptions, and once again, that was enough to lead all of pro football. That means that in five out of six seasons, Lionel Taylor led all of pro football in receptions. Again, the only person to top that run is Don Hudson. Hudson led the NFL in receiving for five consecutive seasons and for six out of seven. Taylor missed the 1965 AFL All-Star Game with an injury. He played with the Broncos through 1966. Denver put him on waivers and Taylor figured his career was over. And that was even after Houston Oilers coach Wally Lem asked him to try out for the Oilers. I was put on waivers, and I said, that said, I'm through. And they called me, and I said, oh, no, I hadn't worked out. And Wally Lim, he says, well, we got a chance to win the championship. And I, I said, what? He says, come on down. i give you $1,000 just to come down and talk to him. And I had a job in Denver there, and I told the people I worked for, I said, I'm going down here and collect this $1,000 for the weekend. I, weekend, I'll be back. And I came back two years later. And we won the division. We got our butts kicked, though, against Oakland out there. But we did win the division. I couldn't believe it. The Oilers won the American Football League Eastern Division in 1967. That put them in the 1967 AFL Championship game against the Oakland Raiders for the right to go to Super Bowl II. The Raiders won that game easily 42-7. You can hear more about the 1967 Houston Oilers from Hall of Fame safety Ken Houston on our sister podcast, the Texas Sports Hall of Fame podcast. And Ken Houston is episode number one of that podcast, which I also host and produce. Lionel Taylor said that his role changed with the Oilers and that he no longer played wide receiver. He played tight end. I ended up playing tight end because at that time they had guys was in the uh, National Guards and some guys couldn't make it to the game. I got called for holding one time in my whole career because the two tight ends, one didn't make it, one got hurt before the game, and they put me at tight end and I couldn't block anybody. <laughs> and I told the quarterback, I said, you know who's a tight end, so don't call no plays over here. So they got me for holding. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor caught 18 passes for the Oilers in 1967. It's fascinating to note that players missed games because of National Guard duty. You might remember hearing Packers legend Boyd Dowler on episode 39 of the Game Before the Money podcast share how he, Ray Nitschke, and Paul Horning were all called into duty during the 1961 season. Lionel Taylor played two seasons in Houston, 1967 and 1968. He retired as a player, but later found work as an assistant coach for the Pittsburgh Steelers under Chuck Knoll. 
You can hear Lionel talk about the Steelers' incredible 1974 draft class in episode 47 of the Game Before the Money podcast. And I will also include some of Taylor's Pittsburgh Steelers stories in future episodes. Right now, however, I'd like to include the story of how Taylor was hired by Coach Knoll. It's a fun story with a twist or two that he told me about when I asked him how he got the job. How did you get set up with the Steelers then? I, I was working in uh, industrial relations in Denver, and Chuck Noll called and started talking about maybe he had an opening for a coach. Finally, I went up and we had an interview, and I really thought I blew the interview because the plane was about 20 hours late because of the weather, and I was tired that night and sleepy. We were just Chuck and I went in and looked at some film and everything. i never forget the two things I told him. I said, number one, you're not using the field. You guys are playing so close in. You know, we weren't taking advantage of the field. And the receivers weren't moving anybody. They was running routes before they got to the guy. They didn't put any pressure on the defense at all. They were just out there. And that night, I got ready to leave. I said, I got to go back tonight. And he says, what? And she gave me a check for 360 or $60 or something. And i never forget. I told him, I said, that's too much. I said, I don't. He says, just keep it for a miscellaneous. Then I got on the plane, I thought about it, I screwed the interview up. So I wrote Chuck a letter, and he called me and offered me the job before he got my letter. And I said, hey, wait a minute, I said, did you get my letter? He said, well, you didn't want the job. I said, no, I just want you to know what I thought that we needed to do as me as a coach, you know. And he, it was good, it worked out great, best job in the world. Lionel worked as the receivers coach for the Steelers and helped build the careers of Hall of Fame receivers Lynn Swan and John Stallworth. He also worked with other great Pittsburgh receivers, including Frank Lewis and Ron Shanklin. The Steelers won two Super Bowls with Taylor as an assistant. Lionel next worked for the Los Angeles Rams on the squad that played in Super Bowl fourteen against the Steelers. Lionel eventually moved up to offensive coordinator with the Rams. According to a 1985 Washington Post article, Taylor was the first black offensive coordinator in NFL history. NFL coordinators are often offered head coaching positions at some point during their careers. When Taylor was an assistant with the Steelers, he was one of the few black assistants in the NFL at the time, and a media outlet asked him if he thought there would be a black head coach in the NFL anytime soon. Taylor's response turned out to be prophetic. When I was with the Steelers, I'm going to tell you this, they came out, that's when they was checking on who's going to be, when they're going to have the first black coach and all this. And I forget the sports magazine says, asked some of the guys, and some of them said three years, four years, five years. I said 20 years, and everybody and they all said, what? You got to be out of your mind. It was closer to the 20 years than it was to the five. I can tell you that. The first African-American head coach in the NFL in the modern era was, of course, Art Shell with the Oakland Raiders, hired in 1989, quite a while after Lionel Taylor had been working for the Pittsburgh Steelers and after he had worked as offensive coordinator for the Los Angeles Rams. Taylor never became a head coach in the NFL, although he had an outstanding career as an assistant and a coordinator. He coached in pro and college football until the late 1990s as part of NFL Europe. His successes as both a receiver and a coach tend to get vastly overlooked, in my opinion, and I was very grateful to have a chance to connect with him for the game before the money. A few things I'd like to reiterate about him as I close this episode. Lionel Taylor was the first player ever to collect 100 receptions in a single season. That was in 1961, and that tally broke his own record that he had set the year before. The record was previously held by Hall of Famer Tom Fears for quite a while. Lionel Taylor and Charlie Hennigan remain the only two players in pro football history to have 100 catches in a season until 1984, 20 years after Hennigan's feat. 
1984 was well into the era of 16 game regular seasons. Art Monk set a new single season record with 106 catches that season, including seven in week 15 against Dallas and 11 in week 16. The next receiver to reach 100 catches in a season was in 1990 when Jerry Rice had exactly 100 receptions for the 49ers, including four receptions in week 15 and nine in week 16. Remember, both Taylor and Hennigan got their 100 receptions in 14 games. Lionel's 85 receptions in 1965 was the highest total from that point on until the 1978 season, over 10 years later, when Ricky Young of the Minnesota Vikings caught 88 passes in the NFL's first ever 16-game season. I don't say this to downplay what those players did in 16 games. I only bring that up to highlight how special Lionel Taylor's seasons were. Lionel Taylor is one of those players that I personally think should be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. In fact, if you asked me if I could put one player into the Hall of Fame, he would be one of the players on the short list. Absolutely. As of 2021, Lionel Taylor and Don Hudson remain the only two players in history to lead the league in receptions more than three times total. Taylor led all of pro football in receptions five times. Hudson led pro football in receiving eight times. Again, nobody else can claim more than three times total. Not Jerry Rice, not Art Monk, not Steve Largent, not Raymond Berry. Taylor's run of being pro football's leading receiver is topped solely by a man who many regard as the most legendary receiver of all time, Don Hudson. Lionel Taylor, truly an exceptional player and an exceptional coach. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Game Before the Money podcast. Special thanks to Lionel Taylor for interviewing for this episode. For all of you Broncos fans, you can hear stories from Broncos AFL legend Al Denson in episode number 52 of the Game Before the Money podcast and linebacker Carl Mecklenburg in episode number 28. You can also hear stories from Lionel Taylor's friend and teammate Goose Goslin on episode number 26 of the Game Before the Money podcast. That episode consists of stories that are outtakes from my interview with him for the book, The Game Before the Money, Voices of the Men Who Built the NFL. Future episodes of the Game Before the Money podcast will feature 1982 NFL MVP Mark Mosley, Bill Butler, who played for both Vince Lombardi and Tom Landry, as well as the Pittsburgh Steelers and Minnesota Vikings in the 1960s. And we will also hear from a couple of Kansas City Chiefs AFL legends, Nolan Supernat Smith and Bob Stein. Great football history articles are available at thegamebeforethemoney.com. Transcriptions of some podcasts are also available at thegamebeforethemoney.com and are powered by our transcription partner, Sonics. S-O-N-I-X. Visit sonics.ai to learn more about their transcription services. Thank you.